Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Support us, encourage us, stick with us. <clears throat> We're here for you. For more difficult conversations to make good trouble, we have with us today David Larson, former chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, a distinguished professor at Hamlin, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law at Hamlin University, and Ben Davis, <coughs> professor at Washington and Lee. Yep. In Charlottesville, Virginia. <coughs> Ben is not to be held responsible for the demonstration that went south there sometime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had they consulted Ben first, it would have never happened like that. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So as we head into 2024, and as I've shared, my standing joke is <clears throat> I'm going to Vietnam in September, October. I think I'll get a one-way ticket and see what happens in November before I get my return trip. So gentlemen. Is there any path to responsible choice that you see? Well, I'm always an optimist. So I hope there's a path to um, responsible choice. Um, one thing I'm hoping is that we have a lot of pending criminal cases against our former president. And although the strategy has been, and somewhat successfully, to delay, 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 I'm hoping that we can get at least one conviction. And I think that those convictions will be pretty significant and that a lot of people who maybe haven't been paying close enough attention will suddenly have their attention grabbed and will say, I've got to reconsider what I've been thinking. This is a convicted felon and I don't see how he could really be the president of our country. So I'm hoping that some of these cases that are pending um, maybe will sober up some people and lead them to more responsible choices. I, I, yeah, I was thinking about these various statistics that come out. I mean, sort of independent of sort of where the political parties are and, and all that, but that when they do these uh, polls of Americans, there's like these amazing numbers, like 80% of the people are agreed on certain things, you know, like the, the women's right to choose, you know, you know, really not wanting the government in the middle of it at all. I mean, there's a lot of sort of, uh, what I would call, you know, the freedom-oriented American wanting to just have your life and not having the government in in the in the middle of your life, right? Um, I think there's a there's a there's a certain amount of that, and um, I think that the probably the most powerful thing going on right now is uh, the uh, overruling of Roe. I think that th that is so huge across America. I mean, you had this sort of Alabama IVF thing too, which was just bonkers for people. But I think uh, that at least from every, even in very red states, right, there's been basically efforts to overrule. I saw that there was, for example, the Florida Supreme Court just said, the six-week ban is okay, and at the same time, they said putting the constitutional amendment on the uh, uh, November ballot is okay too, right? So, and the, the fact that that amendment is on the ballot there, and those kinds of amendments or efforts to restrict abortion have essentially uh, all been decided in the way of women's freedom. Uh, in in and since Dobbs has gone down. You know, I just think that this is a this is a, a a very sobering moment with regards to that uh, that I, I I wouldn't even say it's an undercurrent. I say it is something that is front of mind of a lot of people. Uh, whatever the political games being played are, you know. Um, the other thing is uh, that is terribly complicated. Uh, is the whole thing going on in Gaza, right? Um, that is really very, very, very difficult uh, for, I mean, it's horrific for the people who are there, okay? And um, it's horrific what happened on October 7th, but 
the you know the six months of what's been going on is really very very diff very very difficult and you know and no one really sees a way out of it except you know i i always say you know the diplomats get the diplomats talking you know the diplomats let's get a ceasefire for an hour you know okay now let's get it for two hours oh let's get it for five hours. you know let's get some food in let's get one truck in you know okay let's get three trucks in you know what i mean and you know you know we don't have to, we don't have to solve every problem but let's let's deal with this these right here right but uh you know the the it's a watching what's going on and is just horrific to watch. I mean, I saw it today, for example, um, and uh, Dave, you might really appreciate this, for the targeting, apparently artificial intelligence is being used for determining targets, right? And apparently the artificial intelligence, something called Lavender, it's got a 10% error rate, okay? You know, if you're running a 10% error rate like in in a, a GM factory, you're fired, you know, on parts. I mean, because the Americans were at 5% error rates, and that was considered horrific compared to the Japanese who were at 200 parts per million. You know what I mean? But when you're talking about 100,000 errors per million, that's like a, you know, that's a real comment on the, on the state of AI, you know, uh, that kind of an error rate. So anyway, I, so, and then, you know, the other thing, uh, I'm sorry to go on like this is, um, is this real question about, uh, we used to have this view that, uh, at the, uh, what, at the, uh, at the shoreline, there was going to be unit unanimity. Uh, between the Republican and Democratic parties on foreign policy, basically, there was the, you know that the divisions ended at the shoreline. Right now, I, I, it, it it seems that uh, we're all over the place. We're well, all over the place. And Trump has an envoy who's actually over there attempting to make January twenty twenty five foreign policy. <clears throat> On the presumption that they're going to have the power to carry it out, but yeah, I, I mean, oh, yeah. that if we want to talk about responsible choices, it's about you know, sort of who, who speaks for America, you know, in in, in this in this crazy social uh, social media world, right? Yeah, there's so many things to talk about. Um, you know, talking about Gaza. Um, you know, that has serious implications for the current administration. You know, there's a movement that we're not going to vote for Democrats. We're going to vote uncommitted. Um, uh, you know, what are the implications of that for the upcoming election? Is that going to result in electing the the, the opposing candidate um, because you've stayed on the sidelines? So clearly something has to happen. Something has to change. Because um, too many people are being alienated for very credible reasons based on what's catastrophic um, and the number of innocent people and children that are getting killed. So we've, we've got to find a way to, to stop um, the carnage that's going on. So that's, that's what's the path forward. One path forward is we have to find some solution if we want to move forward. So, yes, Gaza is a huge problem. Yeah, what's another way forward? Well, you know, I think we need to keep talking and we need to keep talking about what's going on and how people are behaving. There's this huge movement about that's kind of aligned with the MAGA movement of, uh, you know, we're patriots. And the people that were involved in the insurrection on the 6th, they're, they're patriots. And we're going to, um, Carry flags, uh, you know. We're gonna we're gonna show our allegiance by the symbols um, that that we carry. And uh, if you talk to these individuals and you kind of ask, how does your allegiance to the MAGA movement align with patriotism and American values? They'll start talking along terms of, well, I think we need to be 
a little more power in the executive. Um, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay um, if we need somebody to be a bit of a dictator. Um, uh, I think that's the best path for America. That's the most American thing. Um, and you, you got to stop people and pause them and say, wait a minute. You know, that's kind of antithetical to democracy and American values. You, you know, to, to say that you support uh, immunity for the president and a, and, a, and a dictatorship is not patriotism. Um, it's something else, but it certainly is an American patriotism. And, you know, at least, at least be honest as to who you are and what you're saying. Um, you know, don't, don't promote something that you don't believe in. If you want a dictator, um, say you want a dictator, but don't call it um, American fundamentalism um, bec because it isn't. So, so I, I think in terms of path forward, we need to keep calling people out on that to say that what you're, what you're pretending, what you're advocating is not patriotism. Um, you know, and patriotism is democracy. And what you're talking about is exactly opposed to democracy. Another thing that's got me concerned is, is, um, is, is kind of the toxic language that Trump's using regularly which I think has all kinds of implications and creates motivations for a lot of violence. And, uh, and I'm concerned about violence for election workers, for election officials, for the infrastructure of polling places, of people who are going to vote, who are afraid of maybe even getting attacked when they show up at the polling place. So in terms of path forward, I think we need to not pretend that this is a very real risk and um, even be more proactive about protecting people who want to vote, the vote, the process of voting, polling places, polling officials. And um, uh, in terms of our path forward, we need to, we need to protect our democratic process as a path forward. And um, and and not kind of be dismissive or ignore what I think are very real threats of violence as we look towards November. So um, as a path forward, yeah, I'd like to kind of ramp up our efforts to to protect our our voting process. Yeah, um, it, it, there's another path forward that uh, from David's comments that got me thinking about was this. Uh, increased focus on trying to improve the life of middle class people and poor people um, in, in, as opposed to the trickle down vision. Um, uh, it, it seems to be paying dividends in terms of levels of unemployment that I think are like the 60s. You know, I mean, I, I you have under 4% unemployment in this country. Now, you can say how the numbers are done and all that, but still, that's, you know, amazing. Um, one of the paths forward that I think also to be thought about is that uh, on inflation, I saw a number that said that, you know, basically 40 percent of inflation was coming from price increases by companies. Right. Um, as opposed to the sort of you know the supply chain and all that kind of stuff that you've heard. It's basically uh, being able to have some sort of pricing power to take advantage of it. So. Um, I was kind of actually happy that uh, there have been some uh, Justice Department filings antitrust against Apple and Google and you know these other ones um, to to really look inside of these uh, tech black boxes, right? And and see how they uh, the kinds of concerns that we have in the antitrust law um, are being met. I, one of the cases that I've always loved to read, it didn't get, it got resolved, was the U.S. versus Microsoft back in like the 90s, uh, where you had these findings of fact by the judge, I think it was the Judge Barrington in D.C., and, you know, he just basically broke down eloquently how Microsoft, you know, sucked all the air out for Netscape and these other companies at the time for purposes of, you know, as part of dominating the uh, the, the search engine uh, environment, you know, 
And so to have somebody be able to break it down and to help us understand how things are being uh, uh, manipulated, I think that that's a way forward. You know, um, I uh, I think it's important because we we do get inundated with a lot of uh, I don't know if it's called marketing or whatever to try to tell us that you know threats abroad in technology are so awful that we have to defend our companies. You know, it's like the the again the patriotism flag, but basically meant about creating shareholder value and and maximizing profits. It's got nothing to do with patriotism, you know, uh, but they're you know pulling on that flag. Um, as to the people who who want a dictator, you know, what is, yeah, David, you, you must remember the, all that talk at some point about the imperial executive. I think it's back in Nixon, even, that they talked about him, the imperial executive. I mean, the, 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 the centralization of power in the executive branch that's been going on for, what, 50, 60 years or something like that. And then as people saying, that's not enough. You know, <laughs> like, really? You know, really? That's not enough? You know, it's been 50 years of centralizing power in the, in the executive branch. And it's like, no, we want more. Uh, and of course, this immunity thing, the fun thing with that is that it, it just goes back to the fundamental debate back with the guys back in the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution time, right? Some people wanted essentially George Washington to have a coronation, right? Like a king when he was the first president. And he was smart enough to say, no, that's okay. You know, I, and, <laughs> you know, that, that whole yearning for uh, a king as opposed to the structure that Madison tried to put in place with the separations of powers and federalism and everybody yelling at everybody, but uh, avoiding that exact kind of centralized power uh, to some extent. You know, I just you know, think it's uh, it's it's an irony to hear people seeming to yearn for kings. You know, yeah, the yearning for kings. Yeah, it's I think it's a fear of freedom in a way. Yeah. Um, it's that you know I, I'm I'm kind of afraid of what freedom means and what responsibility and what that might bring. So I'd rather have someone telling me. You know, it's, this whole idea of executive imperialism, you know, there's different ways to get there. Um, you know, we have three branches of government, but one way to get there is make make some of the branches ineffectual and um, unoperative. So let's make Congress, let's make Congress impotent. You know, let's make sure that Congress can't pass anything, which is yeah. kind of where we're at right now. The country still has to operate. I mean, there, there are things that have to be done if we make this body inoperative, there's only one way things will get done, and that's executive order. So this is kind of an indirect way to kind of maybe get the result we want. Let's let's kind of sabotage Congress by making sure we don't produce anything that's going to be helpful. It's just going to stagnate, pursue um, some some impeachments and things that are really not that any evidence based, and we can achieve this this kind of stronger executive uh, another way. Um, ben, you mentioned the unemployment. You know, in terms of the path forward, making sure that people understand this information and information, what the difference is, you know, that low unemployment rate, that all happened in a world where there wasn't almost a single economist who was ready to predict that we were going to be able to emerge from COVID without a recession. Mm -hmm. And a recession typically means massive unemployment. It didn't happen. I mean, that's pretty miraculous yeah. um, that we did not have that happen. I don't think people really appreciate how how tremendous that was, that we were able to maintain that low unemployment um, uh, and, um, and uh, you know, preserve people's jobs and income. Um, we haven't got that message out. So on, in terms of path forward, I think highlighting some of the realities of the past few years some of the productive legislation that was passed, um, some of the accomplishments of, of the current administration is a is a path forward. I don't think we've done a very good job of of making people understand that. I think it's, it's, they failed in that regard, and they've got to do they've got to do a better job. 
I think that there is something to be said that we are all suffering some kind of post-traumatic stress from the pandemic. It's like a hangover psychologically uh, that is that that affected all that's affecting all of us uh, because that was you know. Um, and, and, you know, and getting us out of or getting us bit by bit out of that funk uh, of what that did to us is still I think it's a, a work in progress here in this country. Um, uh, the other thing is that uh, about the dysfunctional Congress vision, you know, basically it's what the chaos vision. Right. I mean, it's like let's create chaos because it, chaos is to the advantage of somebody. Right. Um, to to exploit that if Congress doesn't do anything, you know, then you know you don't get any rules changes, you don't get anything sort of addressing the issues. You know, for example, regulating tech companies. You know, okay, there's nothing gets through, so they just can still keep making all their money. You know, I'm not against tech, but I'm just you know pointing it out is that you can't get legislation through that might actually be needed, right? The one area that I find interesting to watch right now is the judiciary, right? So the nature of how judicial decisions are being made in different parts of this country. Um, and I just saw something that, uh, you know, to avoid what they call judge shopping, um, there's been a rule that's been put in place by the judicial conference that uh, the appointments are supposed to be random, right? And the chief judge for the Northern District of Texas says he's not going to abide by the new rule, right? You know, I was like, that's pretty interesting to have the chief judge for a district court in the United States to be given a rule and to say, I'm not going to abide by the rule. I mean, you got to think about that for a second. What does that say about the, uh, what does that say about something going on in the judiciary, right? Um, and. Yeah, it's really, it's really disturbing. It's really just so we talk about the rule of law and mm -hmm. the respect for the rule of law. And we've got a former president who has no regard for the rule of law. But it's really, as Ben's mentioning, really distressing if people within the judiciary start disrespecting the rule of law. That's that's not only unsettling, that's frightening. Yeah, and, you know, um, w one of the things that I've, <laughs> that I do worry a lot about, I must admit, it's just maybe more recently, at what point is someone considered to be in violation of their bail conditions and they get remanded back to be in jail pre-trial, right? I mean, it, the, the re, you know, obviously I'm speaking about these different gag orders being done with regards to the way that uh, um, a former President Trump is acting right about his cases, and um, you know, I, I'm just imagining if there was some kind of ordinary citizen acting like that, that I was out on bail, that the judge would cancel their bail, and and they'd have you know in New York it'd be Rikers Island, they'd be in Rikers Island, right? Now, even if the you know if you say, but you know, the person is a candidate, yeah, I know they're a candidate. Well, you know, it's too, you know, a lot of people have jobs too, you know. <laughs> You know, uh, but it's like it's at what point, uh, and I understand the idea of like, well, we don't want to make them a martyr, you know, all that kind of stuff. I understand all that, but I'm just sort of looking at it from sort of that rule of law perspective and respect for the judicial process vision that, you know, is there a point where. I mean, for example, I saw that there's this one state court judge. Okay, he's just increased his gag order to say you can't talk about anybody, but you can talk about me, right? Okay, I, I you know, the judge, you can talk about the judge all you want, right? And I'm thinking like, well, wait, you know, the, the judge is a person, yeah, but the judge is also this organ of the state, right, that is dispensing justice. And as a consequence... You don't just get to say anything about that organ of the state. You can say anything about you, me, you or me, okay? But at some point, the organ of the state should be able to say, hey, excuse me, you don't talk about me like that. You're going, you're remanded. you Because you're not showing the, the proper deference to the judicial process that is that every other defendant I've ever seen 
or in civil or criminal cases has typically shown, except, you know, you get these once in a while, somebody jumps over a thing and tries to beat up the judge and they get arrested and they get charged with another crime, right? You know, but generally, you know, there's a lot of deference in that courtroom, right? And when you think about it uh, on another level with these cases of disbarment of lawyers that are going on right now, which is like lawyers losing licenses over the kind of stuff that they allowed themselves to, to do. Remember, you know, lawyers were supposed to be officers of the court, David, right? Remember that? You know, there was like, there's a client and then you're the lawyer, right? And you're, you know, you're the kind of reasonable mind, no matter what the client is saying, right? And we see these lawyers like going off the deep end. I'm going to jump in on one other, one other path forward um, as in we're closing seconds. Um, I think incre- incre- increasing voter rights is a path yeah. forward. And, um, you know, in Michigan, um, we've expanded access to voting. Uh, we expanded nine days of early voting are now possible. Um, it's easier to vote by mail in Michigan, more access to drop boxes, um, an expansive list of accepted notifications. New York requires high schools to provide voter registration forms to students. Nevada makes it easier to vote on reservations and incarcerated individuals vote from jail. So I think that's a path forward. In contrast, you look down to Mississippi, Mississippi passed SB 2358 that says anyone who's not an election official, postal worker, family member, household member, or caregiver, caregiver, and assists a voter with turning in their ballot will receive criminal penalties. It's like, oh my God. It's, could anything be more undemocratic? So if we want a path forward, I think it's it's expanding um, voter eligibility and the uh, and the process for voting and not doing things like Mississippi has done. So where does this leave us? <clears throat> and we can all kind of take all of these thoughts and so many more that you've alluded to. And, and every single voter is going to have to go into that voting booth all by themselves, and hopefully some little Jiminy Cricket of conscience and character and courage will come to them in that moment, and they will see and make a responsible choice, if not for themselves, for the people they care about, for their children, for their grandchildren, for the community, if we understand the choices. So what I'm hoping is in the next six months, The Democratic Party makes those choices crystal clear by showing us what they are in the terms of ordinary people, the stories of ordinary people's daily lives, how they're impacted by those choices for health care, for education, for governance, for voting rights, across the board, employment, all of those things. Those choices are clear, but we need to understand that. Get the rhetoric get the polemic, get the propaganda out of the way. See the choices in human terms, ordinary people terms, and make those choices. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech. Ben, David, thanks for your thoughtful, insightful perspectives. We hope people will take them into account and take them into those voting booths with them and listen to the Jiminy Crickets that we all need to hear. Think Tech Hawaii. Join us again next week. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much.
Aloha.